Yeah, just just because someone disagrees with you, that doesn't mean that it's an unsafe space. Um, yeah. if, and if 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 you would say you're not perfect, then you should expect at some point for your view to be challenged. Like it, mm-hmm. you can't have both. I'm not perfect, but I never want to be challenged. Like those two just don't those two don't exist. Like I, I have to be. Hey, and that's the beauty of the body, the imperfect body of Christ is that's why he says it's one is one body, but as many parts and no part of the body is too small. And I think that's what we mm-hmm. that's the type of community we want to look for uh, when we talk about because we're not going to find a perfect church, but we can find an authentic and a healthy church and a healthy church has issues, but they handle them in truth and in love. What's up, everyone? Lisa Fields here, and I'm so excited about our new curriculum, Courageous Conversations. You heard about our popular conference, Courageous Conversations, where we invite the leading pastors, thought leaders, and scholars from conservative and progressive backgrounds for conversations. But we not only want to have those conversations on stage at the conference, but we want you to have them in your everyday life. So we developed a curriculum for you to do just that. Courageous Conversations curriculum, the tools you need for the conversations and culture. You can get that today on Amazon or on our website at Jew3project.org. Well, thank you for watching another episode of the Jew3 Project podcast. As always, I'm your host, Lisa Fields, the founder of the Jew3 Project, and you can see I'm not in the studio today. I wasn't able to make it in, but I definitely want to get this interview in, even if I'm not in studio. Um, So I'm excited to have someone who's no stranger to the G3 Project on the podcast. His brother was just on last week. Many people don't know that uh, him and Malik uh, are brothers. So we got two brothers back to back (laughs) on the podcast. So uh, welcome, uh, Pastor Jerome Gay. Welcome. How are you doing, Jerome? Lisa, thank you so much. It's an honor. Any chance I get, uh, opportunity I get to come on Jew 3 Project, I count it as an honor and a privilege. So uh, I appreciate that. Glad you had my brother on. Uh, and so I, I can't wait to hear and check out that episode as well. But listen, I'm I'm grateful for this opportunity. Yes. And as I always like to tell Malik, uh, we have the his real uh, brother that's actually a Christian. Um, Malik is Christianity is still suspect to me. But, uh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> hey, I pray for my brother. Don't tell him I said it. Uh, <laughs> no, Malik is a Christian for real. I just like to tease him yeah. that his brother actually walks closer to Jesus. Jerome, tell our audience just a little bit about yourself. Well, again, thank you, Lisa. I am uh, I'm from originally from Washington, D.C. I am the husband of my wife for 21 years, the father of two. I am the pastor of Vision Church and the author of four books. Uh, my first book was called Renewal, Grace and Redemption in the Story of Ruth. My second book was The Whitewashing of Christianity, A Hidden Past, A Hurtful Present and A Hopeful Future. My third book was Talking to Your Children About Race. And my latest book is A Church Hurt, Holding the Church Accountable and helping uh, hurt people heal. And so I'm an avid uh, sports uh, watcher. Uh, I love the gym and working out. And uh, clearly, I I like writing. So uh, for and counting. And so, uh, again, I'm grateful for this opportunity. Awesome. Well, we're talking today about uh, your your, um, fourth book, Church Hurt. Uh, I think you've been on here to talk about all your books, except maybe the one you wrote for how to talk to parents, how parents yeah. talk to their kids about race. Um, but tell our audience why you decided to write a book on church hurt. Well, we, well, Lisa, you as an apologist and, you know, this, this platform that God has continued to grow and praise God for that. You're always engaging reasons of doubt and uh, the new buzz term, uh, and it's a legitimate term, a uh, deconstruction. And so one of the things I do in the book after kind of defining church hurt, the differences between structural church hurt versus personal church hurt is I I cite how, you know, there are reasons for deconstruction. And so there's just opposing views and ideologies. It's kind of the first of three concentric concentric circles. Uh, There's low spiritual discipleship and spiritual tolerance in terms of growth. But then that third circle, and when you put all three together, is church hurt. And so church hurt can uh, contribute to deconstruction because it, it it impacts and affects 
how people see God because they're expecting healing, fellowship, love. And sometimes that's not the case. And so seeing people walk away from the faith and this being one of the contributing, not the only, but one of many contributing factors led me to want to engage uh, and just some of the the cover ups, the cover ups that have been exposed within the church. And so I wanted to write as a as an insider, as a pastor and say, uh, unfortunately, um, I've been on the, the giving and I've caused it, uh, but I've also received it. And how there's still hope for us, and that hope is, is is Christ. Yes, no, that's great. Tell our audience just what is church hurt. Define church hurt for our audience. Yeah, so church hurt is uh, either emotional, mental, spiritual, and sometimes physical hurt that parishioners uh, experience when they go into a church from either the members or the leadership of the church, and it impacts how they view the church and how they. Uh, view God. And so that's kind of a, a, a 30,000 foot view of church hurt. It it affects every ounce of our being mentally, spiritually, emotionally, and in some cases physically because of the anxiety that people experience when they go to the church seeking help and wholeness, uh, but end up getting repeatedly hurt. And again, so structural church hurt is when the leadership wins people to themselves. Personal church hurt is just one believer hurting another. Um, and for it to be, you know, church hurt, because there's a difference. Sometimes I don't want us to confuse, like if someone rebukes you in love, that's not church hurt. That's the Bible says it's useful for rebuke, for reproof. But if there's consistent neglect and abandonment and abuse, that it's a cycle, it's repetitive. That's that's legitimate church hurt that needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. So one of the objections that I hear many leaders to church hurt is like, if you go to work and they hurt you, that won't stop you going from going to work. If you're in a relationship and you get hurt, that won't stop you from being in relationships in the future. Yeah. Why is church hurt? So it seems like so fatal to, to many people. Is it the expectation people have of church? Can you kind of yeah. shed yeah, some yeah. light on that? Yeah, that's part of it. So just like in any relationship, right? Um, an argument comes as a result of expectations not being met or you assuming an expectation, not communicating expectation or someone knowing expectation, but intentionally not meeting your expectation. And so people bring we bring these things to church. And so when I'm going to church, I want to hear the gospel. I want to hear the word. I want to ha have fellowship. I want to be a part of a church that's serving the community. And if you go and you're you're being neglected, you're being abused or you report something and there's a cover up that again, that's going to impact. And so we, we have to be careful with those analogies. I, I do agree that we should not give up on the bride of Christ. But as if the relationship example, the occupational example, the hurt still needs to be addressed. And so the issue why some people are leaving, not all, is because their issues, their concerns aren't being addressed. Um, I quote Job 16.1, uh, 1 and 2, where Job is talking to his friends in the book. And he says this. He says, I have heard these things before. You all are miserable comforters. And he's talking to his friends that I'm putting in quotes. And one of the things I say in the book is four ways that we're miserable comforters to further answer your question is number one is we dismiss expressions of hurt without inspection. So we just assume mm. we just assume the other party, especially if they have a title, that they could never do that. So we dismiss that. And again, that's going to cause people to eventually leave. We delegitimize their pain or their experiences without actually beginning to seek and to dig and to find out what's going on. We immediately talk about the ways the church helps without addressing the concern. Like they didn't say that the church didn't serve in the community. They're talking about this leader that hurts. And then fourthly, uh, we replace counsel, Lisa, with comparison. And we just say, my church ain't like that. Um, and so we immediately start talking about the church up the street as opposed to engaging and addressing the person that's in front of us that has uh, a legitimate concern. Yeah, no, that's that's so good. And we see that um, just all that comes from listening to people without trying to respond. Yes, um, yes, yes. And that's what and it, it really it really starts helping people process when you just listen to them. Um, and we've seen that in Why I Don't Go and just yeah. in I'm sure you've seen that in conversations with people when you just listen, it kind of helps 
them process and get beyond and then start to see the church in, in another light. So the objections that you that you give, well, all church is not like that. Sometimes if people are processing out loud, they'll come to their, those conclusions on their own uh, without yeah. you even having to give that response. But you got to let them get it out first. Yeah. And when we just immediately go to my church isn't like that and we don't ask questions or let that person process, um, all we're doing is deepening the hurt and we're widening the, the gap between the church and the world or so many people. For instance, the church I pastor over 50 percent, I would say it was a 65 percent of our transfer growth. People mm-hmm. are coming with severe church hurt. I mean, I'm, I'm hearing stories of pastors trying to get someone's wife. I'm hearing stories of deacons um, conspiring against um, people. I'm hearing stories of burnout being used and um, perhaps compensating someone for the same work uh, who's new and not compensating the person that's been serving that church for 10 years. I'm, I'm hearing these stories. And so God has put us in a unique position to where by the time they get to vision, they like, if this don't work, I'm done. And I want to tell them, well, no, I, I, I hear what you're saying. But again, don't we're not perfect. Like, I can't <laughs> I can't promise mm-hmm. you that no one will say something sideways. I can't promise you that I won't fail you. What I can promise mm-hmm. you, though, is we, we have real elders who care about the people. We care about your health, your health holistically. We don't want you burned out. And if something gets reported here, we're going to address it. We're going to provide a biblical covering, not a cover up. And so I think just God, God kind of put us in a position as a church where we're, we're literally having to help so many people heal from that, but still value the bride of Christ. We, we can't get rid of her because Jesus died for her. Yeah. And I think, you know, talking about expectations, one of the things I tell people is you got to warn people up front when they join the church. I love that you said, I can't promise that I won't fail you. That joining a church is joining a community of imperfect people. Absolutely. So the probability that you're going to be church hurt is very high um, yeah. because yeah. you're dealing with imperfect people. And if I go in knowing that hurt is inevitable um, because there's no place where you won't be hurt in, um, you know, because we're you're dealing with humanity, uh, then I think that sometimes kind of can lessen the blow. I always use the illustration and I used it a couple episodes ago of, I don't like flying, but I'm, I'm better with turbulence. If the pilot warns me ahead of time that turbulence is coming yeah. versus me just getting surprised by it. And so I think yeah. it's, you can brace yourself better in community when you know this person is going to hurt you, but that goes for all community. That's like marriage, right. friendship, all the things hurt is inevitable. And I think we have some kind of way because of social and this kind of culture of boundaries and protect my peace that we try to enter spaces. We try to create safe spaces that aren't really say there's, there's, I don't want to, there's, I'm not saying anybody should join an abusive space, but I'm saying the aspect of safe spaces is not always realistic. This idea of safe space is not always realistic. Can you can you speak to that? Yeah, I'm giving you some snaps because you you just that <laughs> for you. So, so so two things. So two things. One, um, and I'm glad what you said. So church hurt is inevitable, but it's not acceptable. And that's mm-hmm. that's what that's what we want to communicate and how we respond mm-hmm. when the person says they've been hurt. Now, is there a probability that Maybe it wasn't that legitimate. Like I said, it could have been a a biblical godly rebuke. And this person is just not used to being confronted. Right. So -hmm. we need to examine how that's handled. But, yeah, so I I do think it's important. And listen, Lisa and I both, we don't we're not minimizing trauma. We're not trivial, trivializing trauma. Um, But we are in a culture where people think that they need to enter spaces and always be right and always be affirmed. And the church is not that space. It's it was never intended to be that place. That's why you have Paul literally writing first Corinthians telling them, y'all got to grow up. The the theme of first Corinthians is spiritual maturity. And he's addressing things that they're getting wrong. 
And he's correcting them on relationships, on sex, on singleness, on food sacrifice to idols, on the spiritual gifts. And he literally says, I don't want you guys to be ignorant. Uh, First Corinthians 12, verse one about the I want you to know how to live as an adult Christian. And so mm-hmm. we we need to say, again, hurt is inevitable, but this environment is not acceptable. But we need you to be open to the reality that that there is a possibility that some things you might be hypersensitive on. And we may need to dig into some family of origin issues as to why that's the case. But also we need to be open to the fact that, hey, there is two sides. The Bible says the first one to cross examine seems right into another one. I mean, the first one to share their case seems right into another cross examines them in Proverbs. So we do need to hear both sides. That's those are the things we need to look for. And not have this unrealistic expectation of no one disagreeing with me or no one confronting me. Um, We're literally supposed to do that in a church, but we are supposed to do that in a loving way. Yeah, no, that's that's extremely important. And um, I'm glad you clarified because I didn't I don't want people to think I'm trying to minimize trauma. We just did a whole uh, episode no, with yeah, your brother. I know you're not. <laughs> yeah, trauma. So uh, yeah. I'm glad you clarified because somebody could take that and say Lisa doesn't. Uh, Lisa doesn't hear. Um, but I I just wanted to to emphasize that because yeah. I do see us self diagnosing ourselves on social like yes. WebMD. Used to <laughs> back in the day, you used to get a cough, and then you got <laughs> you know. Can, you by the time you look at WebMD, you got cancer. Yeah, but yeah. then, vice versa, we're doing that on same social media with mental health. We watch a couple uh, out of context sometimes therapists talking about issues, and by the time we watch them, we've diagnosed ourselves and everybody in our family with some type of mental illness, and yeah. started taking our own action plan as to how to to help best safeguard ourselves from unsafe spaces. And then we kind of curate spaces in which we can't be transformed or healed. Right. Yeah. Just, just because someone disagrees with you, that doesn't mean that it's an unsafe space. Um, And if, if, if you would say you're not perfect, then you should expect at some point for your view to be challenged. Like it, Mm -hmm. you can't have both. I'm not perfect, but I never want to be challenged. Like those two just don't, those two don't exist. Like I, I have to be, hey, and that's the beauty of the body, the imperfect body of Christ is that's why he says it's one is one body, but it's many parts and no part of the body is too small. And I think that's what we mm-hmm. that's the type of community we want to look for uh, when we talk about because we're not going to find a perfect church, but we can find an authentic and a healthy church and a healthy church has issues, but they handle them in truth and in love. Yes. Yeah, that's so helpful. When we think about church hurt and somebody that's watching going through church hurt, I think about a friend that I had on here uh, years ago who talked about him being um, molested in church by mm-hmm. elder. Um, mm-hmm. And I hear so many stories about that where people have sexual trauma that comes in mm-hmm. church spaces, mm-hmm. have had uh, other forms of abuse, just toxic situations. And they're listening to this and they're like, I hear you. Uh, but like I there's healthier spaces for me to be at brunch. Uh, you know, I understand what you're saying about these like minor things like correction, but I got real, real trauma from church. Yeah, yeah. How do I move past that? What help can I get to get me from that traumatic space to a place of healing, knowing that God we're healed, we're hurt in community, but healing is also um, comes in community. Um, yeah. So how can I get back to community? And I've been hurt in such in, in a in a space that was supposed to help me get healed. Yeah, well, interestingly enough, and not that this is a good thing because you don't want anyone to experience that, but I, I literally have, and she's open about this. One of my staffers, where that was her experience, where she mm-hmm. was uh, she was molested um, um, by the pastor, and to make matters worse. Uh, it was her father. So it was her pastor, mm. her father, and he had abused her. And, um, you know, she she shares that. That is part of her testimony of seeing in, in the, 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 the denomination. Um, I won't say now because she is coming out with some stuff. The denomination covered it up as they begin mm. to talk about 
her experience of being molested, him have being a pastor, also being her dad and continuing to preach as if nothing happened, even though they did report it. So I think the first thing I want to do is legitimize your hurt, your pain. And I understand your apprehension with trusting people and going back to the church. I think that's the first thing we got to do, because we don't want to be these comforters that that Job talked about in, in Job 16. But I would say this, that God still calls us to community. And in the same way, if if someone does an, a rendition of Ribbon in the Sky and they sound terrible, I don't blame Stevie Wonder. I, I don't blame Stevie Wonder for that terrible rendition. And so it's so important that we don't reject Christ or his bride for Christians, we don't reject Christ for what Christians do. Now you would say, hey, I'm not rejecting Christ. I'm rejecting the church. Well, the the biblical problem with that is the church is his bride. It's his bride. And he died for her. And so I want to legitimize your pain. I want to understand your apprehension. And I want to I want to encourage you to pursue therapy, Christian therapy, biblically based therapy to process I don't want you to feel like you need to rush your time to rush right back into a church in a couple of weeks. I want to legitimize the time you need to heal. But I am going to say I want to call you back to a healthy church and for you to ask questions about how they handle things before joining. And if they're not willing to answer that, you got an answer that that's not the church for you. Right. And so I just want you to think through a more healthy filter after processing what you've experienced of how you can enter not with guard, not with fleshly guards up, but your spiritual discernment on point. And I think that's what we got to begin to do. I had um, I, I interviewed Dr. Lyons about my book and she said something so powerful that we're, we're, we're thinking through now. We're literally working on. She said, you know, we we have a plan of restoration for the abuser, um, but we don't have a victim recovery plan. And so we talk about we want to show grace and not. And I was like, that was so profound. And so I think and this is a word for all churches is what are we doing for the victim? Like we sat, we sit the abuser down. In some cases, we take their title or whatever the case, we put them on a POR, plan of restoration. But we need to think through that. And when I hear stories like that, it just it confirms that we have to do better. Uh, a better job of shepherding the victim, the person who was hurt, the person who was abused. So those are some things I would say to that person, Lisa. Yeah, I love that uh, Dr. Lyon said that victim recovery plan, because oftentimes the recovery plan uh, doesn't doesn't um, always sometimes includes the person just going to another church. And it's like that doesn't help. Yeah. Heal. Yeah. How can we help um, help um, in ways we may have enabled the abuser? Exactly. Um, yeah. And so um, I, I love that she said that when we talk about church hurt, one thing you, you talk about in your book is not only people, parishioners being hurt, but pastors being hurt. Yeah. Uh, many people don't think about church hurt in that way of uh, pastors being hurt as well, because it's. I guess sometimes we we act like pastors aren't human and right. they can't be hurt. Um, can you speak to that as a pastor, the church hurt that pastors experience? Yeah, that particular chapter is called um, Attack from the Pews. And, uh, you know, I reference, you know, number 16 uh, when they had this whole uh, coup attempt of, of Moses and uh, and Moses is not you know a pastor, but we we see just someone in leadership being attacked, right? And so mm-hmm. pastors, the, the the difference that we need to understand, I always go back to Hebrews thirteen seventeen because it gives us a mutual responsibility. I'm a Bible guy; I want to point people to the Word. And so Hebrews thirteen seventeen it says, "Hey, the pastor has to answer to God for the souls of the people uh, they pastor." But then it says the congregation should make it a joy for them to pastor you. So it gives both responsibilities, like both have a responsibility to be mutually encouraging and mutually edifying. But some of the ways pastors are hurt is when when they're just seen for their communication gift, but not their person. So just preach me happy, but I don't care about you or your family. 
Um, when when people uh, when people do, they they they'll listen to a abusive leader with a communication gift and reject the faithful pastor that will counsel you. That is at your baby dedication that's coming to your house. We're hurt when we find out that you we you've joined the new church and we find out on Facebook. <laughs> you didn't even <laughs> didn't even talk didn't even talk to us, didn't didn't say anything. Um, they don't understand the hurt where we we have to explain to our children why that family is no longer there because they just upped and left and didn't explain anything. It's hard for the pastor's wife to know if she has true friends or is that woman just trying to get close to get tea on the pastor and the family. Um, and then I'll just end and say, lastly, you know, the the big biggest difference is if you get if the member gets hurt, they can just leave with their church hurt. The pastor has to lead with their church hurt. You can just leave with yours. We have to lead with ours. And so I just think it's important that we both understand. And this is why the uh, Paul uh, Peter talks about how we, you know, the devil roams around like a Roman lion seeking who may devour. But one of the tricks of the enemy is to get us to devour ourselves. And as long as we have this kind of pastor versus the people, that's not God's intent. The shepherd should smell like the sheep. My my job as a pastor, any pastor, is to lead, feed, know, care, protect. We need to do that. And the members need to make it a joy when they have a faithful pastor. Make it a joy for them to pastor you. And that's how we can have just an imperfect but healthy and authentic community of faith. Yeah, I love that. And I love you. You mentioned the family component. I'm a, a PK. PK, you so know. I understand <laughs> <laughs> the the challenges of and I and I also think people don't consider this, but there's this dynamic where leaders, Christian leaders, people love the leader, but they don't really care about their family. Uh, and yeah. so you see this when the pastor dies. In the past, I've seen this a number of times. I have friends that had mega church pastor fathers, and when their dad passed, they were treated like trash. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, how do you love the dad, but you don't love the kids, you don't love mm-hmm. the wife, and yeah, you just let her um, have to deal with it. Uh, or, you know, if there's a scandal with the pastor, they leave the pastor's wife and the kids to themselves. And so all of these are factors in which leaders and leaders' families have to navigate through that most parishioners don't consider because they are so in love with the gifting. Are you, it's treating church like a service Yeah. Um, that I, a good in service that I come you give me, I give my offering, you give me a good word for the week. Um, but I don't really care about what you're dealing with from uh, Monday to Saturday, just as long as you show up on Sunday. And so those could, those could be really harmful. That could be really harmful <clears throat> to a pastor and family. Yeah. And thank you for sharing that from the, cause I was, I have two children, so they're PKs. And I, I would just want people to really consider just both sides of this. The hurt isn't acceptable on either side. That's that's the point. Mm-hmm. The hurt the hurt isn't acceptable on either side. But Lisa speaking from the child's perspective is sometimes it can affect um, the way they see church or, you know, your your I got a daughter not wanting to marry a pastor for seeing how they get treated. Like this, it, this thing is deep. Like they see, like I don't want to marry no pastor. I don't want. I don't want to. Have to. <laughs> <laughs> So it's just it's just it's it's <laughs> multi layered. It's multi layered, uh, and that's yeah. that's why the first the subtitle is holding the church accountable, but then helping hurt people heal is like we we we're going to go through that journey together. Yeah, and that's real. Pastors go through a lot, and if you're a PK, you see that pastors have to deal with a lot, and you don't want to sign up for that uh, when you when you uh, <laughs> when you date. The funny story, I was dating a guy in undergrad and he was uh, he was working in insurance and he felt he told me that the Lord had a call on him to be a pastor. And I broke up with him. Such a nice guy. Wow. But it was just it was not He's out here. in the car. He's out here. He's out in these streets, <laughs> dropping brothers like, no, nope. <laughs> Still not looking for a pastor to this day. But um, <laughs> oh, man. 
<laughs> I understand. But, uh, you. <laughs> but when when um as as we're thinking about church hurt, how do you want people when they finish reading your book? What do what do you want them to know? Um, what do you want them to leave with as they in your book? Yeah, so I I, I have a chapter just talking about forgiveness and. Mm-hmm. To, to a lot of people's surprise, I, I make it clear that forgiveness should not be automatic. Now, Pastor Gay, what do you mean? Are you co-signing bitterness? No, no. Ephesians 4.32 says, forgive as you've been forgiven in Christ. So how have we been forgiven in Christ? We admit our wrong. We, we admit our sin. And so I am not saying just give that person a pass. Now, I'm not telling you to be bitter either, because then you make yourself a hostage. But I am saying that if unless that person's dead, but if they're still alive, um, it's nothing wrong with you expecting if they're if they're a Christian for them to own what they did to you. You don't have to just automatically give it. Now, why? Because you end up enabling their abuse when we when we give this repentless forgiveness. So I want to free you from also carrying the burden of releasing them why you're still in bondage. And, and, and I think so many people have commented on how that's helped them. That is that perspective, a biblical perspective. And again, I'm not advocating bitterness, but this, I, this we've, we've gotten forgiveness wrong. This repentless forgiveness that just simply isn't biblical. And people say, well, it says, you know, father, forgive them for they know what they do. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a request that Jesus says, that's a request. But Paul makes it clear, like, you you got to admit what you did, <laughs> right? So yeah. I just think it's important that we we help people. Un- so I want to release you from that. Then I want you, I, I have a diagram in a book uh, called The Bondage of Bitterness. And it kind of walks you through the cycle you're in if you hold on to bitterness. But then there's also just components of forgiveness and how you can attain that and continue to maintain uh, just a healthy uh, Christian life from that point on. And so that's what I want. I want you to process your pain. I don't want you to ignore it. I don't want you to suppress it. I want you to go there. It's going to be hurtful. It's going to be painful. But you can't get free from something you don't confront or address. And so I want to help you go there, but then not stay there. Walking through how you can, what biblical forgiveness truly is, Without you bearing the burden of them, if they're not, if they're being prideful and stubborn, but then also you not making yourself bound by bitterness, how you can free yourself, uh, whether they repent or not, how you can move forward and still not give up on Christ and his church, because no one has more church hurt than Jesus. Think about that for a second. His disciples fell asleep on him. <laughs> he can't eat like can't just <laughs> Judas betrayed him with a yeah. kiss. Uh, several hundred men with torches and whips. John 18 came to get him. They chose a, a murderer over him. He was hung in between two thieves. Jews and Romans conspired against him. No one has more church hurt than Jesus, but he still died for the church. So if anyone has an excuse to give up and to deconstruct, <laughs> it would be him, uh, but he refused to. And so that's the challenge for us. And again, I'm not delegitimizing or trivializing your pain. I'm saying like the Bible says, we do not have an high priest who is unable to sympathize with our infirmities. He he knows what pain is experientially. Mm-hmm. And it says Hebrews 4.15, he was tempted in every way, yet without sin. And so I think that's that's what I would want you to know is that there is hope. There is healing. Uh, this isn't the end of your story, um, but but it is going to require some work on your end um, for, for you to to get what you're seeking. Mm-hmm. No, that's that's super, super helpful. And I think um, important for our audience to know, I, I especially really loved, you know, how you tied in Jesus um, <clears throat> has more church hurt. And I also like how you expanded on forgiveness, because one of the things we hear in the culture, uh, coupled with Christianity being a white man's religion, is this idea of toxic forgiveness that mm-hmm. people feel like Christianity pushes, that mm-hmm. we enable our oppressors by just being willing to forgive them of any and everything without confronting. And so I think I love the way you clarified that because it helps um, give Christians language 
uh, in a response to cultural critique of forgive of God's forgiveness and his call for, to forgiveness for Christians. Yeah, amen. And, and I just think it's so we we literally did a series called the University of Forgiveness, and it was uh, by God's grace we saw a lot of fruit because so many people had some stories where they just thought I just got to forgive, and the person is still mm-hmm. actively trying to hurt them. And I'm like, mm-hmm. no, don't, don't, you know, you, you can withhold it for, from the standpoint of praying that they repent, because if you just give it, it, it's sending the wrong uh, unbiblical message to the abuser. It, mm-hmm. It's sending the wrong message to them. And so it's just so important. It, it says, you know, forgive your brother seven times. It says, if they repent, <laughs> the Bible mm-hmm. says, no, no, if they admit then cause 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 reconciliation is impossible without confrontation. If we don't confront, mm-hmm. if we don't confront the contention or beef between us, then that's fake. That's not real. And so that's mm-hmm. why Jesus, is like, no, like I'm not the problem in this relationship. You are. So let's you own what you did, and I will, through imputation, take on all your sin and give you my righteousness. But you must own the fact that you are a sinner in need of grace. And the same thing applies mm-hmm. to forgiveness. Yeah, no, that's super helpful. Um, how can people get in con- uh, get a copy of your book? Yeah, so here it is for those that may see it. Church Hurt, Holding the Church Accountable, Helping Hurt People Heal. Uh, it's available on Amazon and Kindle. Uh, the, audio, the audio version will be coming out soon. Or if you want to sign a copy, go to JeromeGayJr.com, J-E-R-O-M-E-G-A-Y-J-R.com. You can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Jerome Gay or Facebook, uh, Pastor Jerome Gay Jr. So those are some of the ways you can get in contact. And I, and I do hope I'm, I'm praying that churches will get this. Their discussion questions. It is really designed to be done in groups is the best way to do this. But the goal is is help. And I'm, I'm writing uh, more for change than for checks, um, more for people to really get in and, and get the healing they need. Yeah, that's so important. I love that you said that more for change than for checks. It's the alliteration <laughs> for me. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you, Jerome. It's been a pleasure having you again on the podcast. Get uh, his book, Church Hurt. I know bless you and your congregations. Um, he has the book up, so there's no reason for you you not to get it. Know what it looks like. Go through it with your church so it will help strengthen your church and you won't have people leaving uh because they feel like they've been been church hurt um Mm -hmm. well thank you for listening to another episode you can catch all our episodes on our website at g3project.org you can watch them on youtube facebook or wherever you stream your favorite podcast we have curriculum available through eyes of color courageous conversations and unspoken all of those are available on amazon wherever you get your favorite books they're available. Remember, you could become a partner with the Jew 3 Project by going to Jew3Project.org, hitting that donate tab. You could give by mail or you could give online. Every gift helps equip. And until next time, here at the Jew 3 Project, we're helping you know what you believe and why you believe it. Until next time, grace and peace and God bless.